That's fine. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for, for coming along. Um, myself and um, Smithy, to make it easy for me to pronounce the name, um, uh, are here. I'm delighted to be able to sort of have this um, chat between ourselves, sharing with you about transparency, traceability in the retail world. Smith is the expert. I'm here simply to tease out of her, her insights and her thoughts and um, what she and her company have been working on since 1999, in fairness. Um, a little bit about myself, first of all. Um, you know my name now, you know what, what I do. We are an, an association for independent retailers. Everything from a pet shop to an independent department store is our membership of 4,500 throughout the UK. Um, sustainability, uh, being environmentally friendly, um, being more responsible, are all issues that have been um, talked about by our membership for a few years now. And today I'm looking forward to it. I think I can learn as much from Smithy and bags of ethics and then share back with our membership. But the key thing is learnings and insight from people who, are, who live and breathe what, we're, what we are going to talk about. So that's enough about me. Tell us a bit more about Thank bags you, of Andrew. ethics. Really. That's very kind and generous. Thank you to the Source Fair team for inviting us. So this chat is all about uh, servicing you um, and trying to understand what your needs are about what you want to understand about supply chains, how you want to talk about sustainability with your customers, um, your stakeholders. And so please try and make it as interactive as possible. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about Bags of Ethics, um, it was founded as a business by my father um, in 1999. And I'm pretty sure all of you have one of, your, one of our products under your kitchen sink. Um, we were responsible for creating the alternative to the single-use plastic bag. Um, right. So Tesco, Sainsbury's, Asda, Debenhams, Selfridges, um, a wide variety of retailers used our business to create alternatives to single-use bags. And the most famous was probably the Ladybird shopping bag from Tesco. I don't, do, do any of you have that? Yeah, you do? Um, you probably don't shop at Tesco. You're probably too, too posh for that. Um, <laughs> so our main ethos was to create an alternative to plastic pollution. Um, and plastic bags have been a really tragic um, sort of modern day need for people when they go shopping. So our background is in natural materials, natural fibers, cotton, canvases, jutes, and other materials. And the business has evolved um, significantly over the past 25 years. So I'm really happy to be here mm. because this is our 25th anniversary year. Um, and when I joined the business in 2008, um, I wanted to bring a fashion lens to it. I wanted to celebrate design um, because I think a true way of changing consumer behavior is to engage with something beautiful. Um, so a lot of our shops and, mem uh, and, and customers were from the independent retail se sector. Lots of natural health food shops were our customers. But what we found that they needed was possibly some design guidance and a bit of sort of glamour um, and uh, design help. And that's where our business came in and supported on bringing together fashion brands from the British Fashion Council um, and art directors from various different art um, fairs globally. So here today I'm talking to you about supply chain. So we own our own factory. Um, we're a UK-based company, but we own our own factory in South India. Um, we purpose-built our own factory and we have an 80% women workforce, which we're very proud of, um, which I visit regularly. Um, and the ethos is to give women a sense of financial independence mm. um, and having a sense of pride. So we have uh, every single element of the supply chain and manufacturing process from cutting to stitching to printing to design has women in its department um, and many in leadership roles. So I'm here to explore mm. any Fantastic. element around sustainability and supply chain with all of you here today. Just... Um and we will look for questions and insight from the audience, but just um, 25 years ago, 1999, when you started, I'm not sure this was such a hot topic in that time. So, and as your father 
who started what what was his inspiration at the time I think it was a lucky break if I'm honest so he um, was we have a charity called the Wings of Hope and funnily enough one of the students who were participating in the program um, her father happened to be associated with Tesco and when he found out what my father's background was in jute which is a natural yarn he said oh I've heard of this material but I I don't know what it is, but I've just been to a board meeting at Tesco and they need someone who is an expert in jute. So it was a very sort of uh, happenstance kind of uh, uh, chance meeting that brokered the deal um, and for him to then decide to build this massive factory. Um, but his background was in natural fabrics and natural yarns. And that was the start, his expertise in the, in the, in the fabric and the material. Well, if it's a number one lesson, if you're running your own business, never pass up an opportunity. <laughs> yeah, yeah clearly absolutely. Clearly, it happened there. Yeah. Um, just quickly, drinking a straw poll from people who, who are listening to us today. Are we, are we retailers? Are we suppliers? Put your hand up if you're a retailer. One there. Supplier, brand owner. Just an interested party. Interested parties will do fine. That's okay. Um, you talked about supply, supply chain transparency. It's one of those phrases that people use all the time. I'm not sure we all understand really what it means or what it should mean. Could you help us explain what it means to your company and to you, supply chain transparency, and how do you, how do you ensure it? Okay, so let's understand what supply chain means. Um, that's, I suppose, the start. Yep, absolutely. So the supply chain is every single element of bringing your product from the start of the process right to the end consumer, um, and also to support the consumer in knowing what to do with the product or service after they have taken it out of your store or, or, or brand. So that is every single element of the chain. Um, so if we think about our product, um, we create reusable products. A lot of it is from farm. So we, we have to start with the farmer and the farming community. And then we have to think about the weaving community. We have to think about the yarn weaving community. We have to think about the transporters. How is it transported? How is it entering our organization? Cut, print, stitch, QC checked, and then out the door. And then how is it transported across the world? How is it then delivered to retailers like you? How do you get your goods in? How do you forecast for that? And then how is it displayed in store? You know, what is the way that it's displayed online, displayed on sto in store, and then handed over to a customer? And then when the customer has it, what do they do with it? Do they like to return it or do they want to keep it? And when it's at the end of its life, what happens to it? So I've gone in some detail about supply chain, but I think the key thing is to remember that there are hundreds and hundreds of, if not thousands of people and processes involved across the supply chain. And it becomes quite overwhelming to think that each and every aspect needs to be analyzed, scrutinized mm. from a cost perspective, from an ethics perspective, and then from an environmental perspective. So when you are buying a product as a retailer or as a brand owner, it's really hard to know where's that product from and how are you going to check it's from where it is? So we have in this hall, SEDEX audited um, or SEDEX certified um, suppliers. And that's one way in which a factory overseas or anywhere can then display that they've been, they've been audited and that they can be verified independently for some of their practices. But that's not the only thing. And my biggest piece of uh, sort of my plea to you is that if you were a retailer of a, uh, of a large organization or a small organization, I think it's really important to get boots on the ground and go and visit your partners because there's nothing like human interaction. Um, and I know that many larger retailers um, are trying to automate systems, 
are trying to have tendering processes which are highly sort of computerized and automated, which can actually divorce you from the reality of the people behind uh, the supply chain and who are making your product. And it's only when you enter a factory or you enter a farm or you enter um, places of, uh, which are involved in your supply. I mean, I was really lucky. I was so lucky because my cousin um, works uh, in Maersk, which is one of the largest shipping lines in the world. So I got a chance to go to Felixstowe um, and look at all of the different elements of just cargo coming in on containers and just coming out of those containers and the highly sophisticated services that are involved in just that one element of our supply chain. And it was absolutely fascinating. So if you can go and visit your suppliers and your partners and taking that time, you can probably extract a lot of goodwill um, if things go wrong in your business. I know that during COVID, lots of orders were canceled by retailers or had to be put on hold or delayed. If you know that person face to face, you could have probably brokered a really great deal with them, negotiated some payment terms, supported them and their stock flow. So that's my biggest tip. If you can visit, please visit your supplier partners and have that human interaction. Okay, so for the larger businesses, that's more obvious. For an independent retailer, book of our members who own their one business, their one shop, um, less, less obvious to them, but it's a very good tip all the same. They will rely on, I guess, the um, insight of their chosen supplier. How do they, what, what tip would you say about, I suppose, what, what are the pitfalls of relying on, on suppliers, um, brand owners, and how big a problem is greenwashing within all of that? Okay, that's a, there's that's a lot, a, of, lots, 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 lots of questions. There, yeah. So, uh, I mean, hello, nice to see you. I think it would be good to know what are the challenges from the audience you have and when you're picking your suppliers. Um, I think it's really important, whatever channel you found your suppliers, whether it's at a trade show or whether it's on a platform, you know, when you've searched online and you've found a bunch of, uh, of, of factories, to still have a video call, a regular uh, okay. video call yep. um, with them. Everyone across the world pretty much has access to a phone and a camera um, and asking for a walkabout of the factory. You know, get them on their phone to show you their, 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 their organization. And that's not to be, uh, as, a, as, a, as a supplier and a manufacturer, as well as a brand, you know, sometimes it can be quite scary to have an unannounced audit or to have uh, people inspect your, your premises when you haven't asked them to. But I think by having trust on a very basic human level, it's really important to have a connection. I think there are many, many situations when that doesn't happen. Even if you're a small independent retailer, yeah, yeah. Yeah. you'll be going off reading a report that you probably don't understand has been formulated. It's probably a checklist of questions that you're not quite clear what the technical aspects are. But generally, as humans, we'll have a good gut instinct about the person that you're dealing with. So I think it's important. And whatever language uh, they speak, it doesn't matter because we can all communicate in different ways through non-verbal non communication. So you'll get a good instinct on things. And, and just before we move on to maybe a couple of questions, it, it always strikes me that within this um, supply chain that you you explained how long that can be and how detailed yeah. it can be. The detail contains jargon, it contains terminology that we don't, you know, the lay person may not fully understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how, how does that lay person decipher that best at best? How do, they, how do they understand and really educate themselves, I suppose, around what that really means as opposed to what they're being told it should mean? Well, I think, I think using your good um, uh, common sense is often the best solution to things. And never feel technically sort of mesmerized by lots of terms because that can be quite overwhelming. Just understand, okay, so if you're buying a piece of cutlery, I'm looking at a stand here which is selling cutlery, how do you create the mold? You know, how do you create, what's the source material? Ask the basic questions and be inquisitive. Is, is not a problem. Um, I don't think people will find it offensive in any particular way to be educated. Um, but using common sense yeah. is, is, is the best, I'd say. And don't be afraid to ask those. Don't be afraid to ask. No such thing as a stupid question. Don't be afraid. No. Just 
get it down to the basics and yeah. ask those simple questions. I think there are many industries, you know, finance is one, medicine is healthcare, and, you know, you can have lots of acronyms and lots of alphabet soup of sort of certifications, and it can get very overwhelming. Um, and that's when you've got to step back and say, look, what does this actually mean? What does B Corp mean? What does fair trade mean? What does organic mean? What does compostable mean? And if you don't understand it, that person who's talking about it hasn't explained it to you properly. So go and Google it. Go and ask someone. There's loads of amazing resources. If I can give you two, mm. um, I'd encourage from an educational point of view, there's a really great course online for eight weeks um, by the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, CISL. It's the best money I believe you will invest in um, because it will tell you a lot about sustainability and all aspects of it. And the second is to just ask experts at trade fairs, at organizations. There's always an expert for something and they'll always be very excited to tell you about their research or their topic. And so if you have an eight hour day that you're working in and you care deeply about this, just spend half an hour shooting out a few emails and I'm I guarantee you people will, I'll respond to an email and help you answer any questions that I can within my own industry, or at least point you to some resources. Yeah, okay. So, any questions at this stage from, from audience? No? Okay, no worries. I'm hopefully we're on the, on the right track. Um, the, the one question I'd ask, towards the end there as well, was about the issue of greenwashing, I suppose. And earlier today, um, there was a talk from the CMA, the Competition Markets Authority, about yeah. their latest initiative to, in, in the world of fashion, yeah. to hold the brand owners and the suppliers more accountable for their claims they're making, especially online. A again, how does that lay person cut through the, the greenwashing? Does it come down to the certification and asking those questions still, or, or are, are marketing people finding their way around, around this? I, I know that the CMA, are, the Competition Markets Authority, are really being quite strict about how they're interacting with larger retailers, to the point that a lot of amazing retailers that we work with as a business who do really brilliant stuff are actually uh, not disclosing what they're doing, and they're sort of keeping quiet. And that term is called green hushing. Green That's hushing, green right. Green hushing, <laughs> where you are so scared that you're going to be pinned by the CMA or by any uh, advertising standards authority um, around uh, your claim that, that you, you sort of keep quiet and you don't say anything. So um, let's talk uh, from a retailer's perspective, a brand owner's perspective, and then from a consumer's perspective. So as a retailer, um, Every person within a retail organization is so important. Whether you're the finance person, whether you are the merchandiser, whether you are the operations director, you have a stake on this planet that we all live on. So you can ask some questions and you can also nudge internally yeah. within your own companies about uh, the environmental aspects. And if you don't understand something, you can ask again. If you work in marketing, um, it's really important to celebrate great practices. So don't feel that you have to hush yourself. I think it's really important to, to project really great practices. Um, how do you decipher this as a brand owner and a retailer? There are great accreditations. So organic by GOTS is very good, fair trade. Um, but again, I think it's become so challenging with so many different accreditations and certifications that consumers as well as brand retailers get very confused. So in a new European Union um, initiative that's happening right now is something called the Digital Product Passport. I don't know if any of you have heard of the Digital Product Passport. Yeah? Um, so the Digital Product Passport is basically uh, like a passport for your product. <laughs> Um, where you should be able to trace every step oh, right. okay, so of the product life cycle. So this isn't a passport that makes it easier to import no, no, no. the administration. No. This is about no. the, the, um, the yeah, identity of that, of, that, yeah. of that product. Yeah, so in the EU, it is mandatory 
uh, I believe, in, uh, I think from 2025, but it started to roll out from July this year. Um, so if you shop at IKEA, every single product will have a QR code that you can then scan to see the life cycle of that product. Right. Okay. Uh, you will have labels inside your product which show how to dispose of it. Um, and many of the larger brands are now doing this. Uh, luxury companies like Mulberry are now having it to uh, also certify that when you resell your handbag, you can see who had owned it before. So there's, there's lots of innovation around digital product oh, right. passports, um, which I think is going to make it easier for consumers and retailers to, to trace things. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, the but what, can I just say one yeah. thing? What's really interesting is that um, in sustainability circles, this is all such common language and knowledge. But the problem is to educate the consumers and to educate us as the general public. And I really feel that we're not doing a great enough job of that. And it probably needs uh, policy and regulation around how to communicate to customers and the general public through mass market television, yep. uh, through social media, so that we can, we can do it ourselves. It's just not clear at the moment. Yeah, let's, let's explore consumers then, because um, ultimately, whatever you do as a business has a consumer in mind, the end user. The retailers certainly have the end user in mind. Um, there's been quite a bit of research I, I, I've seen about the behavior of consumers who want to be more responsible in the way they live, especially the, the a younger generation, yeah. more, much more conscious um, decision making. Um, they also expect businesses to almost lead by example yeah. uh, within that. Um, and government. And government as well. So you, we may explore the areas of regulation that, that could help. Um, and I think, the, I think there's something in excess of 70% of people expect their businesses to lead and help, expect their businesses to help them be more responsible in their purchases. However, the downside seems to be, and the disconnect seems to be, that, that responsibility and, and sustainability is seen as a premium product in retail terms slightly more expensive than the basic um, alternative. It, it, does it have to be a premium? And, and how do we square that circle where consumers want to be responsible, businesses want to be, but there's a, there, there's a cost to being responsible that's not always um, manageable within, within the business or for the consumer? Actually, buying less right. is free um, and is highly responsible. Um, and the rental market, second-hand market, is obviously booming yeah. at the moment with Vinted, eBay, uh, all playing their part okay, in yeah. changing the mindset of consumers. So, uh, like with everything, you've just got to use your basic common sense. Uh, do you really need this product? However, if you want to support an independent retailer, which I'm always about championing, it's really important to support people who have dreams. Everyone in this hall has an entrepreneurial dream. They want, to, they want to make money and they want to bring a product to market. We can't cramp that, you know, and we need to celebrate that. We need to celebrate innovation. We need to celebrate entrepreneurship. So how do we mix growth, always having growing sales, selling more, selling more, with buying responsibly and looking at the certification of things? The first is looking at the quality of the product and understanding the material composition. Um, and educating ourselves around it. So things which are not compostable, i.e. they don't degrade into the ground and not leave any harmful effects, are generally a rule of thumb, not right. good, right? So generally, if there's something that you put inside your body, if you eat it and it's not great for you and it makes you feel ill, it's not great. So it's the same conscience that you have for the planet. So if you're taking something out of the planet changing it and chemically engineering it and then putting it back in the planet, which makes it sort of ill, yeah. it's not great for it. So that's one way of looking at it. So looking at the composition. So for example, wood-based items are incredible because they capture carbon and they can compost into the ground and they won't leave harmful effects. Um, when you use polymer-based items, so if we take this table, for example, it's got a laminate and it's probably got a mixture of wood inside it, but there's a laminate yeah. coating. It's quite difficult 
to recycle this because to remove this laminate layer away from the wood is quite challenging. So the be next best thing is to trade it, to sell it secondhand and elongate the life cycle of it. So the two ways of looking at it are, is it compostable? Will it degrade into natural substances easily? Or can, it, can the, the life of it be prolonged? That's why things like single-use plastic items are problematic because they're used once yeah. and they're made from harmful chemicals and toxins, which go into the planet and cause harm. So that's a way of looking at it. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because we're talking about, as a, as a population, consuming less, if yeah. anything, and buying for longevity and extending yes. the life of items, yeah. which doesn't necessarily mean... It, doesn't, it does not mean growth isn't possible, but it does mean a change of mindset from the supply chain, from the retail sectors, because it ultimately means less purchases, potentially. So what is growth, right? This is a really interesting concept, and I'm actually mm. listening to this really excellent book called Less is More. Um, it's a Penguin published book. And it's really challenging the concept of what is growth. So everyone wants growth in revenue, growth in profitability. But that doesn't necessarily always mean by selling more no. physical product. So if you're an independent shop, like the members that you represent, it could be that you make more money by having events in your store, driving people in and making money from people coming and enjoying the store experience, having a sense of community. They may not necessarily have to buy tons and tons of items or you charge them a membership in some sort of way. There's, a, there's different ways to skin the cat of earning more or growing. Um, when you come from a manufacturing perspective like us, that's very interesting. So uh, a, a, an output which is measured very strongly is how much of your capacity are you using up? Is yeah. it 80%, 90%, 100%, 20%? And really, you want to be operating quite close to capacity, not yep. right at capacity, but at close. That means you have to produce all the time to hit your uh, KPIs. Um, but something that we're exploring quite a lot is not just producing virgin product all of the time, but actually accepting back dead stock items from others and seeing how we can re-engineer it. But our philosophy has always been on creating products that last a long time. And it's actually a cannibalizing principle. Because if I can make, if we can make a reusable uh, shopping bag, for example, which can, be lo can last 5,000 times, there's no point coming back to us and asking for another one. But that's a philosophy that we're quite proud of. And the, the point you make about um, the need for businesses to think creatively is very well made. I know, I know within our membership that the, the, the service elements of retail are probably stronger now than ever. You know, the, yeah. the, the people yeah. are looking, not necessarily, you know, if, you've got to, if you break something, maybe go and get it repaired instead of buying new. Yeah. And there's more and more businesses offering those repair services now, yes. whether it's clothing, whether it's fabric, whether it's furniture, uh, as you highlight. So th those are growing elements of, of introducing a new income stream to replace the fact that not as many, not as much product will be sold. Yeah, and that's as, great. You know, it's um, great if you can uh, elongate the life of your gorgeous dress for a little bit longer because someone's sort of yes. patched it up for you. Brilliant. No, no, t totally agree. Totally agree. Um, I suppose where that should take us now is, is looking ahead, you, you strategically will running your business where you do, your manufacturer, your brand owner as well. Where do you see, well, what do you see the, the next challenges over the next five? You talked about consumer education. Yeah and the, possibly the need for government intervention or yeah. some kind of a, a national policy to help people. Is that, does, that begin, does that begin in the education process? Yes. Should, should, we, should we introduce uh, sustainability, responsibility within education and bring that through? Yeah, I mean, I'm absolutely passionate about children as advocates um, and active agents in our family units and in society and them pushing us to do better. Um, uh, so yes, children and education, every single aspect of learning can involve sustainability. So 
um, whether it's a DT class and you're putting together, um, you know, what materials you choose and how you choose them. But frankly, I think children are a lot more advanced than we are as adults because we get sort of sidelined because we have to provide for yeah. everyone and we have to earn money and then we get distorted in our thinking. So yes, it has to involve education. I'm going to do a small plug. Um, I have a, a project called the Green Tree Badge um, which we've done in collaboration with the Royal Forestry Society, um, in which we've... I've actually got a book here. I realise it's in my bag. Um, it's an activity-based um, book of tree activities that we want children to learn more about the amazing world of trees. Um, and we did this because we feel passionately that through fun and education uh, activities, you can learn so much about our natural world, which is abundant, which is so giving and which is so incredible to coexist with. And that respect for our natural world and making money from it, but respecting it at the yeah. same time can come through small educational activities for children. So that's one. As far as government, yes, I absolutely believe that any government has to look at growth strategies within what our planet can give. Sadly, now, what we've got in the Western world is that we have spent years and years and years industrializing and growing our economies based on resources and natural resources taken from parts of the world that weren't from us. Um, and it's very difficult when you're thinking about uh, net zero targets to have it just based um, on the emissions that you emit yeah, as a the country carbon footprint, yeah. and your carbon footprint. It really has to expand to all of the sources of market. So I think there's a huge amount of policy that needs to happen around sustainability. Um, and it's something that we constantly work with government with, within our trade and within our industry. So, but it, that's all very scary and overwhelming. If you can just do your bit within your company and your organization, and then let others, other people know about it through social media, writing to your MP, engaging with your local school or any of your local community, that's the first step. No, well, and, and, and I think that's a really important message as well, because when I talk to smaller retailers and small businesses in general, um, yeah. I would say that it's almost as if um, this, the whole idea of being carbon free and net zero and is someone else's problem almost. Yeah. You know, it's what big it's companies so do, it's not what small yeah. ones do. Um, and, and what difference do we make as a small entity? But you combine the hundreds of thousands of small businesses together, each one making 1% 1 difference, you have a huge amount of difference. Huge. Yeah. That's how Obama won his election campaign. He had lots and lots and lots of small voters yeah. who hadn't ever engaged before, and they made the difference. So, it, you know, small, powerful agents of change really can make a difference. Fantastic. Okay. Any other questions? Just one final one from, from myself. Um, you, I, I love the children's initiative, and I know you mentioned it before we started this talk, and it's something we'd, we'd love to get involved with. Um, if, if, if you were to start today doing what you do, is there anything you would have done differently? When, when you look back, you've been involved since 2004, I think you said. Um, yeah. So is there anything, you, that's 20 years, right? So, 2008, yeah. 2008, yeah, sorry, yeah, 16 yeah, yeah. years. So is, is there anything, if you're starting today, knowing what your business is, is there anything you would have done differently that you'd have got you where you are now that bit quicker, maybe, or a bit oh. smarter? <laughs> it's really, I think, I, I don't know is the answer no. to that. Um, but, I, and, and I, you know, I can answer other questions successfully, so I hope I'm not copping out. No, no, that. not at all. No. Um, but I think to forever be questioning things and forever be learning and iterating is very important. So we can get very set in our ways. Um, we've, we, we're very set in our ways in some things that we do in our business, um, and I'm sure everyone here can, can say that. But I think just taking a step back from your day-to-day, -day, everyday sort of tasks and sort of taking a little bit of time out of your working calendar. And it could be a holiday. It could be some time in the shower. It could be an, a walk in nature and just saying, oh, what am I doing and why am I doing it and how can I do it better is possibly uh, a way of resetting things, um, not just for the sake of resetting things, but just to explore what is my impact on my community 
what is my impact on my company? What is my impact um, on wider society? And if it's not where you want it to be, then you can review and uh, improve. Brilliant. I, I echo that. I think um, I say to everyone um, who cares to listen to me, never stop learning. Yeah. Think, what you're saying. Yeah. And you only learn when you take time out to reflect, yeah. um, explore something different and, and absorb it and then adapt it to what you want to try to do and what you're currently doing in, at this moment in time. So um, I, I mean, that's a great place to leave it. Um, so appreciate your time. And yours. Appreciate your, your um, insight into this I was going to say murky world, but it doesn't have to be murky, does it? It's about transparency, it's about clarity, and it's about having the confidence to ask questions and to be true to yourself in terms of what people are trying to achieve. And uh, so thank you very much, and a round of applause for, for Smithy for coming all the way from London to do this. And I hope, as an audience, you found this interesting. Um, they, it, trade shows, to me, are not just about finding stock for your business, which is so important, of course. It's about taking away information, learning, insight, um, especially in this area, because sustainability, responsibility is not going away, guys. So we have to learn how to embrace it and make it part of our business going forward. So thank you. <laughs>